Folks, Mark Rutland said this in his book, The Finger of God. He said, sometimes the redemptive body of Christ becomes nothing more than the wholesome watering hole for the community of nice guys who want to sponsor Boy Scouts and coach softball teams. And the church becomes nothing more than a glorified Kiwanis club. The church, apart from the dynamic invoked presence of the Holy Spirit, is a monstrosity. It is a ghoulish moving corpse in a tuxedo flaunting its softball teams and men's club barbecues as proof of its vitality, but all the while its empty balconies, its prayerless pews, and its powerless pulpits are crying out, death, death, death. Mm -hmm. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, we're not a church and we're not Christians. Amen. And folks, when the evils of the world around us multiply like locusts, like they're doing now, yes. and the church stands in the middle of that, impotent and silent, not knowing what to say or do, when our love for God wanes and, and our prayer lives dry up to dust and our zeal to win people to Jesus turns cold and, and our worship is stale and dry and routine and boring, when our young people are bored with God and blasé about the greatest story ever told, when we are left with a form of godliness but lack the power thereof, it is all because we're trying to be the church and be Christians without the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. 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 Dr. David Siemens once said, there's no more pitiful sight in the whole world than a half-filled Christian trying to overflow. <laughs> we need the fullness of the Holy Spirit. During a Rose Bowl parade, many, do they still broadcast the Rose Bowl parades? I don't even know. When I was a kid, that was a big deal. They had all those floats with all those flowers on them. And this one float comes sailing across Colorado Avenue and it slows to a stop. And it's one of these big, big monsters of a float. And the crowd watched with amusement as a hatch popped open in the back and a man jumped out with a gas can and went running down the street. And, and they laughed even harder when the announcer came over the PA system and said that the float represented the Standard Oil Company. <laughs> and millions of gallons of gas at their disposal, but they ran empty on national TV. <laughs> Folks, if the church seems to have no power, have we run out of, of power? Or is it that the power is right there for the taking, but we're not plugged in? That's right. We haven't reached out in prayer. We haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts. Here's the story. On that first day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up and preached, and 3,000 people joined the church and got baptized. That's a good day in the church. Amen. Friendship would take a day like that, wouldn't Amen. it? Amen. I mean, you'd have to knock out all kinds of walls to fit right. in Help all us. the people as God. So, they felt the burning fire of God's Spirit in their souls. It was so much joy that day. But then Peter and John get arrested by the same group of guys who engineered Jesus' death just weeks before. Mm -hmm. Now, folks, I don't know if you've ever been personally threatened with crucifixion, but that'll wake you up in a hurry. Yeah. Amen. That's scary stuff. They honestly thought, we're all going to die. I mean, there were times where the Romans would nail 6,000 men to crosses without missing a heartbeat. And they're threatening Peter and John with this kind of thing. And they go back to the church. Now listen, imagine if Pastor Mark or somebody else came back and said, Church, we're in trouble. We're being persecuted. We're being threatened. What are we going to do? What did they do? They prayed. Right. And after they finished the prayer, the room shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want you to recognize, my friends, it was not deep pockets that carried the church through that hour. It was not well-connected political friends they had that carried them through that hour. It was not the eloquence of highly trained preachers that carried them through that hour. It was the power of the Holy Spirit in answer to the prayers of God's people that Amen. carried the church through that dark hour. Amen. Amen. Mm -mm -mm. Amen. It's not an option, is it? Nope. It's not the Holy Spirit, the filling of the, the Holy Spirit is the, the living, breathing spirit of Jesus Christ. It is him come back to be with his church. It's not optional. We have to have the Holy Spirit. All right. The second lesson I learned from this passage is that when God pours out his spirit and when God empowers you as an individual or empowers his church, he does it for his purposes, not mine. That's right. Now, folks, I want you to stay with me on this because we're being sold a bill of goods by a lot of TV and radio preachers right now. Amen. Who preach Jesus like a bunch of snake oil salesmen selling ointment. They say, oh, my friends, and I apologize to the videographer, i I got to wander a bit. Stay with me. <laughs> oh, my friends, are you tired? 
Are you weary and are you worried? Just buy a little bottle here of Jesus Christ. <laughs> He'll meet all of your needs and you'll be rich and happy and well-to-do and you'll have that car you want and that girl you want. It'll all be yours for $1.99. Just send it in right now. Now, folks, I want to be careful here. If God fills your heart with His Spirit, you're going to be a happy person. That's right. Amen. He will meet the deepest needs of your life. Yes, He really will. But let me be clear. The Holy Spirit of God does not come into your life to, to serve you. He comes into your life so you can serve God. Amen. Not to fulfill your agenda and your wish list, but so you can start fulfilling God's agenda and God's wish list. Amen. He will transform your life in ways you never even imagined. And yes, you'll be, you'll be filled with a joy that's deep and nothing can take away. But folks... You're going to become a player in God's agenda. I want you to look at what the power of the Spirit comes and does in the book of Acts. In chapter 1, Jesus promises them a new kind of power. He says, you will receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you will make millions in real estate, and you'll meet lots of pretty girls. Oh, is that not what it says? No. It says, you will be my witnesses. Amen. Yes. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the world. You will tell the story of what God has done for the world through me on that cross and that empty tomb. You'll be lights in the world for God's gospel when the power of the Holy Spirit comes in. So in chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, and I'd love to be up on a fly on the wall that day, what is the initial result? The church started taking up money to build a family life center? No. They spilled out of the upper room onto the streets of Jerusalem telling the good news of God. Yes. Amen. It almost feels like something important is going on here. Yeah. That, that God wants the church to be the carriers of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That that's job one. And then in chapter four, once again, the Holy Spirit falls upon them. The result, they spoke the word with boldness. I don't care what you call it. Evangelism, soul winning, missions. I don't care what name it goes by. Are you doing it, church? Yes. Are you telling Amen. people around you the power of God to save their everlasting soul? Amen. What was the, here's a trivia question for you, Methodists. When John Wesley first started the, the Methodist movement and the Holy Spirit started a revival, we were not a church back in those days. We were just a loose organization of prayer cells. But there was one condition to become a Methodist. Who, who can tell me what it was? I don't have a prize to give away, sorry. <laughs> what was the one condition to be a Methodist back in the day? Not, not prayer. A desire to flee from the wrath to come. Brother, if you're scared of hellfire, come around here and pray with me. Let's get together and work on this thing. Now, I'm not so sure we still believe in hell anymore. And if we don't believe souls are lost, it's not all that important that God find them. But if souls are lost, if we're surrounded by men and women and children whose eternal destiny is at stake, that is a call high enough to challenge my life and yours. Amen. And that's what the Holy Spirit comes to do to empower us for that. Somebody used to criticize old Dwight Moody for his evangelistic methods years ago. They said, Brother Moody, I don't like the way you do soul winning. Big tent meetings with sawdust on the ground and 57 verses of just as I am. And Brother Moody said, you know, maybe I'm doing a lot of things wrong. I'll be the first one to say I probably am. But I like the way I'm doing it wrong better than the way you ain't doing it at all. Amen. 